Next, we are blessed to be joined today by four hierarchs in a panel discussion moderated by Father Chad of St. Vladimir Seminary. I encourage all of you to take a look at the full bios of each hierarch, each of whom has a very full experience of work in the church, but in the interest of hearing from their eminences themselves, I'll keep these verbal intros quite brief. His Eminence Archbishop Elpidophoros of America, most honorable exarch of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, is the eighth Archbishop of America elected since the establishment of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese in 1922. He studied in Lebanon and Greece and taught both in Greece and at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts. His Eminence has also served on a number of international projects and councils dedicated to the church. His Eminence was ordained to the Holy Diaconate in 1994 and to the priesthood in 2005. In March 2011, he was elected Metropolitan of Bursa and in August of the same year was appointed Abbot of the Holy Patriarchal and Sabrapegial Monastery of the Holy Trinity on the island of Halki. On May 11, 2019, he was elected Archbishop of America by the Holy and Sacred Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate and was enthroned at the Archdiocesan Cathedral of the Holy Trinity in New York City on June 22 of the same year. His Eminence Metropolitan Joseph is Metropolitan of the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America. He was consecrated to the Holy Episcopacy on June 30, 1991 at St. Mary Cathedral in Damascus after many years of serving as a deacon and priest. He was born and raised in Syria before studying in Lebanon and Greece. His Eminence returned to Syria to serve as priest before serving in London and then Cyprus in the 1980s and early 1990s. After his election as bishop, his eminence returned again to Syria before coming to the United States in 1995. On July 3, 2014, Archbishop, Archbishop Joseph was elected to become the Archbishop of New York and Metropolitan of all North America by the Holy Synod of Antioch. His eminence has dedicated his efforts to maintaining close clergy relations throughout the diocese, to spreading the word through modern technology, and to cultivating an active pan-Orthodox community in the Western United States and Canada. His Eminence Metropolitan Nicolae of the Romanian Orthodox Metropolia of the Americas was born and raised in Romania, where he first studied theology. His Eminence continued his studies in France, where he received his doctorate in 2001. Along the way, he was ordained to the diaconate and then to the priesthood in 1997, by which His Eminence served the Romanian Orthodox community in Germany, while also participating in dialogue with other churches in Europe. His Eminence returned to Romania and on December 18, 2001, took his monastic vows. His eminence was ordained and enthroned as Archbishop in 2002. Under his guidance, the Romanian Orthodox Church in the Americas established a new diocese in Canada and two dioceses as a Metropolia of the Americas in 2016. His eminence was elevated to the rank of Metropolitan later that same year and enthroned the following spring. His eminence, Tikon, Metropolitan of All America in Canada, was received into the Orthodox Church from Episcopalianism in 1989, after which he studied at St. Tikon Seminary in Pennsylvania and subsequently joined the monastic community. After finishing his studies at the same institution, he served at St. Tikon's as lecturer and instructor. In 1995, he was tonsured to the lesser schema with the name Tikon, and later that year ordained to the Holy Diaconate and Holy Priesthood. In 1998, he was elevated to the rank of Egumen, and in 2000 to the rank of Archimandrite. In December 2002, he was named Deputy Abbot of St. Tikon's Monastery, and on February 14, 2004, consecrated as the first bishop of South Canaan, auxiliary for the Diocese of Eastern Pennsylvania. He was installed as Bishop of Philadelphia in Eastern Pennsylvania on October 29, 2005. From 2005 to 2012, he also served as rector of St. Tikon Seminary. He was elevated to the dignity of Archbishop on May 9, 2012, and on November 13, 2012, Archbishop Tikon was elected primate of the Orthodox Church in America. Our panel will be moderated by Father Chad Hatfield, President of St. Vladimir Seminary. Father Chad came to St. Vlad's from St. Herman Seminary in Alaska, where he was serving as the Dean. His experience in various pastoral teaching and administrative roles spread over some 41 years of ordained ministry are now blended into his ministry of seminary and formation at St. Vlad's. Father Chad, as you all know, also serves as a member of the OCLI board, and it has been a pleasure to work with him over the last couple of years. Father, I'll hand it over to you. We are honored by your presence at this, the fourth conference of the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative that we've been able to co-host uh, as St. Vladimir Seminary. And of course, uh, with the pandemic, we're doing things a little bit differently this time around. So again, we are grateful. I'm going to sort of cut right to the chase for the sake of time, because we want to make sure that we get through these five uh, questions, which actually have been formulated by a committee 
There were, of course, many, many more questions, but we've zeroed in on these five as a group. And we will do the round table according to the diptychs, uh, starting with uh, His Eminence Archbishop L.P. de Forest, going to Metropolitan Joseph, then to Metropolitan Nicolaia, and then to uh, Metropolitan Tikhon. So starting off, um, we're looking at this question of servant leadership, doulos leadership, and your own personal preparation and training. Uh, you can certainly feel free to reflect on anything you've heard so far, but in particular, we'd like to hear from you on your own training and experiences for leadership, the challenges that you faced, and what you've had to learn along the way, which you might say the hard way. Uh, your Eminence, Archbishop Elpida Forrest. Thank you, dear Father, dear Brother Hierarchs in Christ, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a joy and privilege for me to have the opportunity to address this distinguished uh, gathering of uh, scholars and uh, uh, faithful. Uh, as I already presented uh, in my uh, recorded uh, presentation, uh, for me, uh, the, the leadership's foundations are uh, based in the experience we have uh, in our spiritual life close to our spiritual fathers who are our examples and who are our guides in our uh, uh, church life and in our spiritual life as faithful. This, experience, this is uh, the, ex the experience uh, that we have uh, close to these spiritual fathers Either they are our church leaders or our spiritual fathers uh, in the very strict sense of the word uh, is useful, is the only guide we have together with the prayer and our sacramental life in, our, uh, in, the, in the way we uh, develop our skills and our characteristics as leaders and spiritual fathers ourselves. In, in the life of the church. And of course, everything is based in the evangelical teaching, in the teaching of the gospel. And of course, in the life of the prayer we have as people of prayer and sacramental, and, and people who have sacramental life connected with the Holy Sacrament, especially with the Holy Eucharist. We, uh, do, we all uh, develop our own um, um, image and of leadership in the church, and uh, not only in uh, according to our own character, which is given to us, which we have, we possess, but in the way we uh, shaped this character that we have during our service in the church, and the way that our spiritual fathers and our uh, the leaders of the church, where we are obedient and we serve they supported us and they, uh, they tried to cultivate the spiritual life in ourselves. Uh, this is the first reaction uh, I would like to have be, because all the things I, I have already said in, in details in my recorded um, presentation, and I'm ready to uh, answer any possible questions that you might have on this in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. We'll, we'll actually switch now to Metropolitan Joseph to talk about his training, experiences, and challenges in leadership. Good morning to all of you, uh, Your Eminences, Your Graces, and uh, Fathers, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege I'd like to be uh, for the second time with you in this conference last year. We had a great also experience, a, a great empyrea, uh, having uh, like uh, being with you and learning from all of you. So my understanding of uh, le leadership, you know, like I put it in my statement, in my in my presentation, recorded presentation, and uh, I give four examples, you know, like uh, to express myself more and more. My understanding of uh, leadership, you know, like everyone is born uh, like in, in, in God's image and likeness. So God has 
has put in us, has adorned us with, with many, many gifts. But the gifts, you know, like we have to, to develop them and we have to train ourselves and educate ourselves and uh, improve ourselves in order all these uh, gifts to, to, to become functioning and to become uh, like uh, uh, grown, to grow, uh, to grow more and more in, in our life. So experience, you know, like when we say experience or when, when we say leadership, it's not like something, you know, like we get it like as a gift and, uh, and just like because it's a gift, you know, like we have to be successful leaders. No, leaders, you know, like they have to improve themselves day after, after day, like doctors, like lawyers, like teachers, like bishops, like, uh, you know, like any, any, anyone is doing something like uh, in, uh, in, in his life. So the four, uh, the four examples I would like to give, like uh, that beautiful, beautiful thing, like when our Lord was in the presence of Pilate. So many accusations against him, they brought against him, he was quiet. So his leadership, he chose his, to, show, to express his leadership in silence, for example. He didn't, he didn't need to, to defend himself. So the other thing is uh, the Holy Panagia, the Holy Theotokos. Also, she was quiet. She was in prayer. She was, she expressed her motherhood and uh, the leadership of uh, motherhood in, in prayer and in a simplicity, simple, uh, 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 simple life. The third one is uh, Saint uh, Raphael of Brooklyn. Saint Raphael of Brooklyn, you know, like he, he brought a lot of, of, of teaching, a lot of uh, spiritual uplifting, spiritual growth into this nation because of his leadership. And his leadership, you know, like was, uh, he is the father of the orphans. He was uh, the son of Antioch, we say in his troparion, and he was the boss of America. So he was on the road all the time. And uh, so this is what we learn from these examples. We have St. Herman of Alaska, you know, like he was not like a scholar, like most of you. And, but he, he could uh, touch the whole nation, you know, like with his leadership and, and uh, beautiful experience, you know, like, uh, and love experience ministry and love for, for his people. We have St. Paisius, you know, like the Athenite also. I met him more than once. So he was, he was a great leader, but he was in a living, not in a fancy uh, office like, like me now, you know, like, and uh, he didn't have any, any uh, technology, anything. He was very, very simple, but all the scholars went to him to, to be, to be uh, 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 you know, like to receive wisdom, you know, like from, from this holy man. So his leadership was very humble and very, very uh, modest and uh, godly. So we have also the last one, you know, like I would say, St. Uh, John Maximovich also. You know, like these, these great people were good leaders and real leaders. So when we say leadership doesn't mean like how much you know, like books you have read or how many degrees you have and how many. No, uh, my understanding is, and this is what I am doing and with, you know, like I don't like to talk about myself because I am not like the best example, but uh, my understanding of uh, leadership is by, by loving people and by serving them. So, so, so these two, you know, like, come uh, from, from all the good examples I mentioned, I brought up to you. And, uh, and, and uh, so uh, leadership is a gift from God, you know, like, but also, as I said, you know, like it, it has to be improved day after, after day. Thank, thank you, Sayedna, those are beautiful examples. We'll go to Metropolitan Nikolaya to address his own training and leadership, his experiences and the challenges he's faced. Yes, thank you so much, Your Eminence, Your Graces, 
fathers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a joy and an honor to be part of this uh, panel discussion and uh, this conference. Uh, I'll start remembering my uh, experience in Germany. You could hear that I served the Romanian parish for five years in Germany. And uh, after five years in Germany, I arrived on this continent uh, in 2002, being elected uh, an archbishop after 35 years of service of my predecessor of uh, thrice uh, memory, Archbishop Victorin. I, I arrived here and I discovered a more a Protestant pattern in the organization of our parishes, meaning that um, the priest was considered a servant in the altar and the uh, people on the parish council were supposed to take care of all administrative tasks. Uh, the parish, parish council president was considered as a president of the parish and the priest was more uh, an employee of the parish council. So uh, this uh, reflects uh, an unorthodox understanding and uh, we decided uh, to try to, to change this uh, to uh, go to the Orthodox understanding that the priest and the people are supposed to work together, that uh, everything in the parish administration should uh, uh, go through the priest's uh, blessing and understanding, and uh, that uh, it, it is not true that uh, a layman is a, is, a, is a president of the parish. So uh, we decided to change the status, but, but most importantly, uh, we decided to try to teach the people that uh, what does it mean to be a uh, servant, to serve in the church. And you, I, I have to remember you the words of St. Paul the Apostle, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, and, and stewards of the mysteries, mysteries of God. So this is, I guess, the, the main point we have to teach our people and to, to, offer, to offer our own example. I was able to, uh, to listen to the second presentation of uh, Deacon uh, Sergius. I enjoyed it very much. He, uh, his conclusion is that uh, we are all called to live in true, true humility acknowledging that we are men and women under authority. This is uh, the conclusion of the last example he used, uh, Matthew 8, the healing of the centurion's servant. We are under the authority of those whom God has appointed for our care, and ultimately we are all under the authority of our Heavenly Father. So I guess all of us, hierarchs, priests, people in the, in the parishes, we need to go through this process of understanding that we are all servants and we are ultimately responsible to our Father who is in heaven. But my experience of 18 years here teaches, uh, teaches me that uh, every time we uh, establish a new parish, every time we receive a new priest from Romania or elsewhere, we need to go through this whole process again and again. And this is not only for the new priest or for some people in the parish, this is for everyone. Since this is, a, this is fundamental for our understanding of a Christian service in the church. So I guess uh, these are my first uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Emin, it's very insightful. Your beatitude, uh, would you like to address your own training and experiences and challenges in servant leadership? Sure, thank you. Uh, your eminences, Reverend Fathers, brothers and sisters, it's a joy to be here. Um, I, I appreciated the words that were offered by the, the, the hierarchs uh, just preceding me, as well as the videos that uh, His Eminence, Metropolitan Joseph and Metropolitan Epi de Flores prepared, uh, as well as also um, I very much appreciated the presentations by Father Mark and Father Sergius that were available for us to view. Um, so I'll just say a few uh, brief things. One, to add to, you know, uh, both Father Mark and Father Sergius, I think very helpfully emphasize the importance of the value of obedience in leadership. 
And um, I would just add that it's very difficult to train someone in obedience because obedience is really an attitude or a disposition of the heart. Um, and those things like obedience or humility are really, we can't define them, but they, they can be experienced. As St. John Chrysostom says, the gifts of God are so great that people can scarcely ever believe it. And it is not surprising if they cannot understand them till they know them, know it by experience, which is very similar to what other fathers like St. John of the Ladder speak about when, um, you know, trying to describe humility or love, which St. John, for example, of the latter says it's like a, a man trying to explain the sweetness of honey to people who have never tasted it. Mm -hmm. So I think as far as my own experience, I would wholeheartedly agree with uh, Father Mark when he suggests that we should understand all authority in the church as an undesirable station. Um, it's difficult for me to speak about my own uh, leadership development because I can't identify any points in my life that might be linked together to, tr to trace a trajectory of my leadership development. In high school, I never held any leadership position except for my church youth group, where I served as treasurer and president for one year each, but only because no one else wanted to serve in those positions. In college, I didn't take a single business or administration class because I was not at all interested in those subjects. Um, although I have worked in secular employment, I've never held a management leadership position. When I entered the monastery, I started as a novice. My ordination to the diaconate and the priesthood were as a service to the monastery community. When I was elected bishop, I had never served in a parish or dealt with a parish council. I was elected bishop and I and immediately pledged obedience to the Metropolitan. Then I was elected Metropolitan and pledged obedience to my brothers on the Holy Synod. So um, I think I'll just say at, at each stage, I just adjusted my heart to uh, what was asked of me and tried to remember that um, whatever position I was in, I was there to serve Christ and to serve the, the flock that was entrusted to my care. And you know, that's a canonical principle. You know, Apostolic 34 says, um, let the Metropolitan, you know, let all the bishops be in obedience to the first among them and let the Metropolitan do nothing without the support and knowledge of the brothers. And I think that's, that's uh, really the, the key to leadership, which is obedience. Um, I, one of the abbots on the Holy Mountain told me, he says, each monk, is only obedient, each monk is only obedient to one abbot, but the abbot is obedient to 40 monks. So I, I thought that was a, a good uh, approach to take, and I've always uh, tried to do that in my, own, in my own way. So those are my initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, your beatitude. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to actually, since uh, um, our four hierarchs have the thematic questions in front of them, I'm going to combine number two and number three uh, together. So it's a question that's dealing with how do we support healthy change? Uh, how do we deal with the kind of cultural shifts and changes that are taking place, particularly from an American perspective here? Um, how do, 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 do the hierarchs respond when uh, they see that parish leaders are motivated to develop a healthy parish? and be more effective in sharing the gospel, and yet there's resistance from uh, people who will often go right to the bishop to complain about, quote unquote, the changes. Uh, and then the, the understanding of inclusivity in American context, the role of women in Orthodox leadership, how we incorporate the views of young adults and those who feel that they're maybe on the margins. Um, and the whole question of, uh, uh, how, how we, uh, in each of our uh, jurisdictions, we maximize awareness, involvement, and commitment at all levels to this need for leadership. I just add one little thing here. The seniors that I teach every spring in parish administration in their final papers this past year, every single one of them, without question, made reference to the leadership vacuum that they believe exists uh, in the American church here. So we'll, again, Go round robin, starting with Archbishop L.P. DeForest uh, responding in this kind of expanded question. 
Your Eminence. Thank you, dear Father. Um, every time I'm faced with the situation that we make, uh, we need to make some changes, any kind of changes in the church. It's a dilemma, uh, which uh, really it's uh, sometimes it's confusing. And uh, what I have learned uh, in my um, in my service from my service and ministry at the Ecumenical Patriarchate is the following: that uh, sometimes we are driven by our um, scholarly perceptions and we try to apply this to the real life of the church mm. and there uh, there we find uh, the, the conflict and uh, for example even the slightest liturgical uh, change that we want to make sometimes we say okay in the manuscripts it says that this word is a new addition, we need to omit that. And then you see the whole community and the whole parish reacting for just one phrase from the liturgy or from any ecclesiastical service. And there uh, you see how strong and powerful is the sense of tradition in our church. All uh, religious uh, institutions, uh, I'm not talking about our Orthodox Church, I'm talking about all uh, religions and religious institutions are by definition conservative and uh, uh, resistant to any change. So uh, what is then uh, the motivation of any change? For me, uh, Change is necessary only when it comes from our faithful and it doesn't divide the community. These are the two things that I pay always attention. If you see that people, our faithful, are not comfortable with something and this something has to be changed, uh, then uh, we need to be very careful how do we uh, apply and how do we decide this change? If any change in any parish is divisive, it brings division to the people, it, 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 it makes people go away from the services and from the community, this is a problem. I cannot make a change for the sake of change and then lose my people from the parish. The other, uh, the other criterion when we make a change is if it has a doctrinal um, implications or dimensions, if it is driven by the dogma, by the teaching of the church, if there is not such a, an obstacle like a doctrine, then anything can change in the church. Uh, but uh, we cannot uh, uh, sit in our office and make changes on a piece of paper and uh, do not follow the feeling of the people and see are they following us or we're just making another scholarly uh, spiritual exercise on a paper in an office. These are uh, dimensions of any change that we want to make in the church. Uh, for example, I'm, let's go to concrete examples, maybe they initiate some discussion as well. The way we receive the communion during this pandemic, it has been a very broad discussion in the church. There are a lot of people that have difficulty. I don't judge them, I'm just describing the situation. Difficulty to come to communion the way, the way it is distributed today with one single spoon. There are people, on the contrary, that are so against to any change from single spoon to any other option that uh, this brings division to parishes, to people. So uh, if we see in any parish that this brings division in the church, we need to keep this in mind and to respect the feeling of our people. Uh, this is uh, what I wanted to uh, comment about any, any change. The, for the inclusivity that we need to, to show um, 
uh, how much inclusive we can be as a church. Good. Inclusive, we are, am I, can I continue to that or is that another? Yes, Chris, take, take a couple more minutes here and, and address inclusivity, please. Yes. Uh, if, when we are talking about inclusivity, we're not talking about ideas. We're not talking about theories, teachings, doctrines. We are talking about people. People, people, persons for whom our Lord had shed his blood and offered his life and was crucified. This is the sense of inclusivity that we are talking about in the church. And turn it the other way around. We cannot exclude people and take, uh, throw out and, uh, members of the church just because they are different. They think different. They, they uh, dress different or whatever the, the reason is. Or even, or even worse, to judge them uh, because we think they, are, they, have, they commit certain sins that we think uh, they are not uh, uh, permissive of their participation in the life of the church. Of course, there is no scale uh, in the church where we uh, weigh uh, whose sin is more than the others and who is justified to be a member of the church and who is not. Since any person comes to the church, comes to the priest and uh, expresses the desire, the will to participate in the sacramental life of the church, we need to welcome him and try to influence him or her uh, in every spiritual way we can to help him. Thank you, Your without, Honor. Without judging in any way. Thank you. Sayyidina Joseph, addressing supporting healthy change and inclusivity, please. You know, we are facing serious problems because of changes. Uh, you know, I understand also, as His Eminence, uh, uh, you know, like said it very uh, beautifully, that changes, you know, I have to be with teaching and with education. Uh, so we cannot uh, just like because I am the Archbishop, you know, like I can change, I make any change in the church and because I like this or I like that. No, we have also, you know, we, we live uh, in a community and we live with the clergy, the bishops, hierarchs and the clergy and laity. And we are, we are the community. So therefore, when we have to make any changes, we have to teach first. So, and and then to make any any changes, people you know like I from my experience, people are uh, in the parishes. They are afraid to change something. They they uh, got used to it, or uh, or they are accustomed like to 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 be doing that. Uh, so when in the parish council, for example, we see some fight or uh, some disagreement because of uh, people are not ready to change and they are afraid of that change and maybe they are not educated like for for this change so i think it, uh, only god uh, does not change only the truth does not change only the doctrines uh, do not change but everything else you know like uh, it has to develop and has to change and has to to, to start again, and uh, this is uh, like a wonderful thing to, to keep doing that in our, uh, in our life. And uh, the participation, now I switch to something else like uh, 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 the participation of a woman, you know, like uh, of the women, like in general, in, in, we, we don't see any difference between this and that, you know, like we are not here to discriminate and to to say, you know, like as His Eminence said, that we have this community, we have a church, and we welcome everyone, and uh, so no difference between male and female, and uh, so so we don't have, we don't see it that way at all. Thank you, thank you, Sayedna. Um, uh, Metropolitan Nikolaya. Yes, thank you. I guess I I just uh, follow up my. Uh, uh, initial thoughts uh, about educating our people in the parishes. 
about uh, working together, the priest uh, with the parish council, to say that uh, after changing the status back in uh, 2005, we uh, we had to uh, find a way to implement the new the new provisions. So, uh, in the views of this uh, working together, so uh, it was a whole strategy to to be put in place and to go and discuss and explain and educate um, the priests and the people that um, this is the orthodox way of dealing with uh, issues uh, in the parish. Uh, it, it is a whole process, and uh, in this process, um, the people sitting on the parish council should understand they they are the leaders together with the with the parish priests. They are the leaders of the parish, so they, they, there is a need for a vision there. They need to uh, evaluate where they are, where they want to go, uh, what are the means to achieve the goals for the future of the parish. So this is what you are calling, I guess, strategic planning. Yes. Uh, so this is part of, um, of a whole process of educating people. And again, going back to, uh, to the Holy Scripture and, uh, and uh, the fathers, um, there is, a, there is a, a very, very important quote here from uh, John 14 will do even greater things that he did because he goes to the Father. So the invitation is to understand that working together, we can accomplish uh, uh, important things in our parishes. Um, remembering the last six months, we uh, have tried to discuss the new situation with our parish priest, the uh, conference or uh, this uh, Zoom platform, and uh, we decided together what to do in the parish. It was not myself giving orders to the priest what to do, and it was just uh, uh, this, uh, discerning the common mind, how we are supposed to, to deal with this uh, unprecedented uh, situation, how we are supposed to do with the liturgical uh, life, and uh, it, it was a common mind. Let's proceed in this order and let's uh, explain to the people that we decided together. So it was a common work and uh, after six months, uh, everyone uh, or almost everyone looks pretty happy that uh, the, the liturgical life was preserved in a, in a good order according to the rules and recommendations. And now after this, this uh, six months, they can uh, get back to the, to the normal uh, parish life, almost normal parish life, uh, uh, being, uh, being uh, pleased with uh, uh, the preservation of uh, the liturgical life during this, uh, this uh, crisis. So about uh, inclusivity, uh, when I arrived here, I was pleased to see that there were already uh, women sitting on the parish council. They were welcome to be part of the parish. It was a, a ladies auxiliary organization, very active in the parish. Uh, so I welcome the, this uh, understanding that everyone is invited to work in the, in the, in the parish for the good of the parish uh, uh, future. Uh, of course, there are still misunderstandings about the role of the parish council of this uh, uh, ladies auxiliary organization. But um, um, I guess um, we have the opportunity to address all this during my pastoral visits and uh, to find a way to um, restart this educational process. Being a Christian, so looking uh, at uh, the neighbor and uh, loving him according to our Lord's uh, commandment and being uh, a leader, because we are talking about uh, the, the parish council members, being a Christian and being a leader. This is again and again uh, something we need to talk and to, uh, um, to see if uh, our people are aware of this. So, uh, of course, uh, everyone is uh, welcome to, to work and to be present there and to share uh, uh, his or her talents with, with the others. Thank you.
Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, Vladika Tikhan, uh, your response to supporting healthy change, addressing resistance to change, and then this question of inclusivity. Very good. Um, not to be repetitive, but I will uh, say again that obedience is key here, um, but no one can force obedience on another human being. Uh, each human being must be willing to assume the attitude of obedience in order for change to take place. Um, and I think there's an analogy to the mystery of holy confession. Um, and without obviously revealing any specifics, I, I can say that I have never witnessed any spiritual child of mine change their, their, their sinful activity or overcome their passions because of something I said to them. Um, the only change that takes place is when the heart itself is moved to make the change. And of course the change comes through, through Christ. Um, so um, any attempt by a leader to sort of smash through resistance and sabotage is I think doomed to fail. Um, I think the only way to pass through is with humility. And for me, the, the most apt image is Dorotheus of Gaza's image of the swimmer. If you're familiar with that, you know, he, he says, uh, uh, if, you know, a good swimmer or bad swimmer, when he goes into the ocean and the waves are coming against him, he tries to swim over the waves and he gets pushed back. So that's, you know, that's sort of fighting change and, or pushing your way through. But the good swimmer, he says, goes under the waves. You know, he, he, he goes down. In humility, he goes under the waves and that way he makes progress. So I think w that's a, an attitude we all need to have, both as leaders and as, as those who are uh, following the leaders um, to try to uh, acquire that, uh, that attitude of humility and to face the, the changes um, with, with that attitude rather than trying to fight them. That's usually what we like to do is to fight changes or to push through changes. Um, but neither one of those uh, approaches, I, I think, uh, works. As far as inclusivity, I just, uh, again, will echo what I thought Father Mark Bulos said very well in his uh, presentation when commenting on St. Paul's image of the, uh, the body in Ephesians. You know, um, you know, just that, you know, by inclusivity, we're not trying to be nice and include everyone so that they, they can be participating, is I think how I'm interpreting that. Um, our aim is to ensure that all parts of the body are working together towards a single goal of service to Christ. So um, to me, there's, there's um, I, I don't, uh, the term inclusivity doesn't mean much to me. I don't understand what it means. Um, I, I think it's, you know, we have in the, the church, uh, um, you know, I, I, Father Sophroni says um, in one place, um, there's no occupation that debases a person only sin debases a person. You know, and he also says that all human beings are equal because they all have to follow the same commandments, right? So to me, that's, that's, that's where the inclusivity comes in. Uh, we all have to follow the same commandments, um, regardless of the work we do or, or the position we hold or don't hold. And I think that applies, you know, to, to women and young people and anyone who's, and as, and as the question says, on, on the margins. The question is not whether they are women or young men and young women um, or have uh, some kind of impediment or uh, weirdness about them. Uh, the, the question is, do they love Christ and his church? Do they have a talent that can help the body work effectively? And do they have a flaw that gives them an opportunity to grow in humility? So to me, that's, that's what inclusivity uh, means. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, end there. Thank you. Good. Your beatitude, many thanks. Uh, the fourth question here, if, if you're looking at it, um, we'll kind of combine it again. The question is, what do you think it would be the most effective ways to A, deliver ongoing continuing education and leadership for priests, clergy, lay leaders already in the field. How can an organization like Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative 
uh, help. And the third one is, uh, what do you think needs to happen in terms of seminary curriculum and changes in developing leadership qualities uh, for your seminarians? We'll go to Archbishop L.P. De Flores. Thank you, Father. I will try to combine um, all the questions into one answer because I think uh, I have the feeling that this is the answer. Uh, we have two. Uh, we have two two things here. I understand that we, uh, we the, or the hierarchs and the clergy tend to focus mainly on the spirituality, obedience, spiritual life, sacramental life, etc., for leadership. Uh, and uh, underlining the piety and you know all the virtues that uh, the spiritual and the ecclesiastical virtues. But uh, we nevertheless have to remember that a leadership is a leadership, and it needs also the leadership skills to be developed. Not only the spirituality. The spirituality comes as a completion of the role you are called to play in an ecclesiastical environment and is a reflection of your own spiritual life and spiritual leadership. And on the other uh, side, we uh, cannot only focus on leadership skills and uh, um, appointing people to different positions because they are good in administration and because they have uh, the skills uh, required uh, on, uh, from a secular point of view to these positions. We still have to remember that, uh, that leadership is a service and is a service in the, uh, at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are an ecclesiastical body. So then the question is, how can you combine these, these two things? It's, it's difficult. There is no school for that. The only school for that is what we, as traditio, as, as we inherit, as we learn from our own spiritual fathers, and then we try to teach to our spiritual uh, children and uh, the people we have around us. Uh, traditionally, it has been proven that uh, brotherhoods or um, uh, groups who have the same spiritual father, let's put it in a very more general way than a monastic uh, understanding of that. Uh, that's why uh, monastic environments are, uh, are more, uh, um, uh, have offered to the, to the church so many leadership, so many leaders and examples for uh, leadership in the way we understand it in the church. Uh, uh, with stewardship and service. Uh, but uh, this doesn't mean that uh, only in monasteries we can grow leaders or we can develop these leadership skills in the spiritual way we understand it. Every parish I, in, in our archdiocese, we have parishes who are, uh, which are, I mean, centers of spiritual life who offered to the church hierarchs, clergy, uh, chanters, psalties, and such a rich, rich spiritual life and, 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 and enrichment of uh, the uh, leadership of our archdiocese, which means that again we come to the one uh, central um, uh, criterion, which is the father, is the leadership, which then gives birth to leadership. Uh, both in, in a secular uh, sense and in a spiritual sense. Thank you so much. Very insightful. Uh, Metropolitan Joseph? You know, the most effective thing like to, to uh, empower or to, uh, to call, call it a leadership in our life is, uh, as I said, through education, through experience, and through teaching, through learning, through uh, obedience, through uh, prayer, through all, all that. Uh, so that's why what I started in the West until this moment, I am in the East, I live in the East, but I still uh, every, every February, every year in February, we have a clergy seminar 
beside everything we are doing, I started there 25 years. And uh, some of you, some of the scholars present with us here uh, were our speakers. We invited them to be our speakers in, in, in those seminars. And, you know, like uh, I heard it from the clergy that uh, because of these seminars, you know, like their skills have, have, have grown and have uh, developed and have uh, improved. So, so through teaching, through education, as I am saying. Now, uh, you know, we learn from the examples I mentioned in the beginning, uh, especially uh, those great uh, holy people, uh, Saint Raphael, one of them, uh, he, he, he understood and he uh, brought all the success and all the glory to this Archdiocese through his, through his ministry, through his uh, travels, you know, like around, around the nation. And it took him from Los Angeles to, to, to uh, from, from uh, New York to Los Angeles, three months on the way, three months. He stopped in every parish, in every, in every. He was with the suitcase all the time. He was uh, uh, staying with people. Now we stay in hotels, we stay in fancy hotels and whatever, but he stayed with people and, and he, uh, he he built he built a beautiful friendship and uh, and and uh, and and spiritual children because of of this kind of lifestyle. So uh, so you know, like even we graduated from seminaries, from universities, from colleges, from. Uh, and we became, you know, like with big, uh, you know, like knowledge, I would say, but still we need more. We need more and we need to uh, humble ourselves and say, you know, like uh, still I, I am a beginner. I am, I don't know enough. I, I, I need to learn from everyone. So, uh, so learning and teaching. So I focus on, on learning and teaching uh, a lot. So this is this is like what I, I, I think it is the most effective way of developing a, a good leadership. And uh, uh, so now, uh, you know, like we have to define our goals also. We have to define our goals. We have to know where do we go from here in five years, in 10 years, in two years, in 20 years. One, one day I asked uh, a fellow in, in our archdiocese, uh, what's your vision for, uh, for the church to, to grow? And uh, what's your vision? He said to me, what kind of vision? I said, you know, like, if you don't have a vision, you cannot grow, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, become like uh, prosperous. And uh, so I told him like what I meant by a vision and whatever. So that was 10 years ago until this moment, I'm still waiting for that, that paragraph, like to tell me what's his vision for that church to grow. And uh, so if a priest that does not know like how to grow a parish, how to, to have a vision in that, you know, like the priest or the bishop or a scholar, a teacher, a father at home and those leaders, you know, like we have to have new ideas every single moment. And we get the, the new ideas from learning, from teaching, from, from, uh, from uh, you know, like uh, being with people and learning from them. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, so uh, you know, like we have, we have to, to, to uh, be with people in order to learn from them. So now, uh, another question here, um, Father, is like what seminary curriculum changes might be needed to support leadership, education, and training? So thank God we have, we have wonderful uh, seminaries here and they are training and they are doing, and, but uh, the seminaries uh, need like more vision every year and with the, from the hierarchs, from uh, the, the, the deans, from the scholars, from the professors. 
So, uh, you know, like we cannot repeat ourselves uh, ourselves all the time, like the same. And uh, what we learned uh, ten years ago is different than now. So we have to to improve our our uh, curriculums, and we have to we have to improve uh, the seminaries also and uh, the, what we are teaching. <clears throat> Thank you, Sayed. Uh, uh, Metropolitan Nikolai, maybe you could address this middle question, which is. Uh, What's the role and, and place of the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative in, in delivering this kind of continuing education and awareness of the need for servant leadership? Yes, it was exactly my intention to uh, just to offer some practical uh, ideas or requests since you are working on this theme on, of Orthodox leadership. I think we, we should uh, keep in mind that uh, some of our jurisdictions, uh, including uh, ours, are uh, still uh, bringing uh, people from uh, outside the U.S., from uh, the old continent. So they are not at all trained uh, to do uh, a new mission they are called to here. So you might want to put together all these ideas and have a curriculum uh, appropriate for uh, the new priests are coming over, uh, thinking that uh, there are still uh, uh, new parishes to be to be established, some of them are uh, are small. Uh, the people have no idea what whatsoever what is going on uh, on this level of of leadership. So small small lessons uh, followed by discussions. I think it would be very useful. So to, you you already have a lot of teams here cultivating vision, effective parish leadership teams. Maybe you can develop all these teams, uh, hearing all these uh, reactions and uh, thinking again about new priests, new parishes, so that they, they can use your, your inspiration and your experience. This, this would be of, of, of great importance for, uh, for the future mission, uh, again, for those who are just coming over. Thank you. Thank you. Your beatitude, um, you have the final say here. All right, uh, I will agree with everyone uh, be that spoke before me. I just. Uh, but add, I think I, I certainly agree, uh, any work that can be done in, in terms of this, this organization, the seminaries is really crucial. Um, we, there is a lot of, there of material uh, resources and, and knowledge that, that needs to be shared and learned. So I, I agree, uh, even though I spoke a lot about the importance of obedience and humility, I do think it is important to provide these opportunities um, to be taught certain specifics about leadership, about administration, about life in our world today. I think all of our seminaries do that to some degree, but there can certainly be uh, more of that. Um, and I think, but whatever context is provided, I think it is important that it be um, a place where people um, can be beaten down, you know, uh, that's the, the real benefit of seminary, for example, is not just learning things, but being crushed by your professors and by your brothers who disagree with you and arguing about things and, you know, worrying about how you, you know, your community service, which isn't part of why I'm here, you know, all these things are, you know, in a sense, a weight that, that crushes our heart. And, you know, when our heart is crushed, then of course, as the psalmist says, God um, does not despise us. He comes to us. So um, I think, you know, it's, let's, we need to do a lot of things. You know, I myself, uh, I, ha I rely on a lot of help. I have, you know, a, a spiritual father, of course, but I also have a, a sort of a administrative therapist that I've been speaking with every two weeks for the past 10 years. Uh, to help me with, you know, very uh, concrete issues, and it's been very helpful. Um, but it's also humbling, and so I, I, I accept that as a humbling thing. I'll just, uh, I think for me, it's it's kind of summarized by uh, my first visit to the Holy Mountain. Uh, when I went as a novice, I, I I arrived at the the dock at below Simono Petra Monastery. If you've seen pictures, I've been there. You know, there's a very long, uh, steep climb 
to get to the monastery. So I, I got off the boat and started walking up in company with uh, Father Kirill, who was from the Serbian monastery. He was also going there. And I, of course, was an American with my heavy backpack with everything I needed. And he was just carrying a little uh, satchel, uh, being an Athenite and knowing <laughs> the long walk that lay ahead. Uh, but of course, I said, I, I offered to carry his bag for him. And he said to me, no, a monk must always carry something. So I said, okay, very good. Um, then I got to the monastery and I was at the services and the beautiful services. And I sat in one of the stasidia and uh, Father Makarios, the, the guest master came over to me and said, excuse me, Father Mark, I would brother Mark, uh, you're sitting in Father Gabriel's place. <laughs> So I, I, I just left. Uh, that was just a funny story. But um, then uh, Father Makarios gave me a book, a little article written by Father Emilianos, who was still at, at Simono Petra at the time. And uh, it was on obedience. And in that little article, the Father Emilianos spoke about the abbot being the image of Christ and how all the brothers looked to the abbot as Christ himself. And I was reading this as a young American convert to orthodoxy, and I said, boy, that's not very humble. How could he speak about himself as Christ? Uh, but then a few days later at the vigil, I was uh, blessed to speak with Father Emilianos myself and to uh, hear a word or two from him. And then just being in his presence, I realized that he, he, this is a humble man and he can say that he is Christ. Uh, not because he's proud, but precisely because he's humble. So to me, that, that, that's an example to me of, of humble servant leadership. It was only a, a, a day, a, a moment. I, didn't, you know, I can't claim that he was my spiritual father, uh, but at that image that whole, of, uh, stays with me and I think gives me a, um, a model for what humble uh, leadership uh, can be, which is not letting people walk over you, but actually uh, leading people with humility towards humility, which is towards Christ. Again, thank you, your Beatitudes. You know, at every liturgy, we pray for our hierarchs that they will lead us and rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, so we've had that experience in this uh, hour and four minutes. Uh, we've actually done rather well. Uh, I'm going to ask His Eminence, uh, Archbishop Elpida Forrest, to close us with prayer. And then Holly has a few uh, housekeeping announcements. Your Eminence. Thank you, dear Father. I will close, if you permit me, and since you ask me, with a prayer to the Holy Spirit to illumine us, to illumine our minds, and to cleanse our hearts so that whatever we do in our leadership positions, we do not our own will, but his will, his divine will for the benefit of his servants, of us, of his church, the members for which he sacrificed his blood and his life. Dear Fonton Agion Patero Limon, Kyrie Isu Christeo Theos, Eleison, Kesoson, Imas, Amin. Thank you, Father. Isvalai Despotan.